two sides to the practice, the side of letting go and the side of developing. We hear a lot about the letting go, and there are a lot of things we do have to let go of. Just sitting here focusing on the breath. A lot of other things are going to come into the mind. Then you just have to say, no, 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 no. Try to have that discernment that the Buddha describes as being a well-plastered wall. The enemy tries to climb up the wall, but they can't because the plaster is so smooth. You don't want to lead any toe holds or hand holds for anything to come into the mind right now. Which means as soon as you see the mind latching on to something aside from the breath, you want to cut it off. This is another analogy the Buddha has for wisdom. It's like a knife. As soon as you see that something's catching a toe hold, you try to look at it. And if you can just let it go without much more ado, then fine. Other times, though, you actually have to look into it. Why is the mind attracted to that kind of thinking? What pleasure does it get out of it? What gratification? And look at the drawbacks. As the Buddha said, if you were to sit there and think about that kind of thinking for a long period of time, where would it lead the mind? To a place you want to go or some place you'd rather not go to? Remember, your thoughts are not just little balloons that appear and then pop above your head. They lead to habits. They lead to action. They have their consequences. That's one thing to think about. What are the consequences of this kind of thinking? Where is it going to lead? Sometimes it's just a little tiny thought plants a little seed in the mind. And then the seed begins to send roots even though the mind may seem to have a nice wall there, it'll find a crack. Like those banyan trees that can take down buildings. You find sometimes those little tiny seeds can destroy whatever skillful qualities you're trying to work at. So this ability to let go, to abandon, to cut away is an important part of the meditation. And then on the other side, there's the developing. In terms of right effort, there are actually three levels to developing skillful qualities of mind. One is just giving rise to them. Like focusing on the breath. That's the beginning of concentration. Focusing on the body in and of itself. It's the beginning of mindfulness, the beginning of concentration. So if you find that you've been away from the breath, just come back and reestablish your mindfulness. That's the beginning. That's the giving rise to. And then the next second, from the next second on, it's a matter of maintaining and developing, bringing to culmination, as the Buddha said. You've done one breath, okay, now you do two, now you do three, now you do four. Just keep at it. See how many breaths you can make in one continuous long tracking shot. We're not here to have a movie with lots of quick cuts. We want to see what's the world record we can establish for ourselves and how long you can stay with the breath. So obviously the maintaining and the cutting away are going to have to work together. As soon as you see that anything has the slightest inclination to <laughs> have a pull on the mind, you've got to drop it. And one way to work against that pull is to try to make the breath as interesting as possible. Notice when you breathe in, where do you feel it? Where does the sensation of an in-breath start for you? It may start in a place that it doesn't start for somebody else. How do you know that the body needs an in-breath right now? How can you tell when you've been breathing out too long? As people get older, they have this tendency. John Lee noticed it. That you start breathing out too long, you're squeezing out your energy. Do you find that happening? You try to shorten your out breaths. Learn to become more and more sensitive to how you can read the needs of the body and compensate for some bad habits you may have picked up in the way you breathe. 
because the breath, when it's handled properly, is medicine. It can give you energy when you need it. It can calm you down when you need to be calmed down. It can help you deal with pain in different parts of the body. You learn how to breathe around the pain, through the pain, so you don't feel so threatened by the pain. And as you're doing this, it becomes not just maintaining, but also developing. The concentration deepens, gets more firmly established, and begins to show some of its rewards. There is a sense of ease, just the fact that you haven't been worrying about other things for five minutes. That's a good sign right there. That's a healthy thing for the mind. And often we overlook that as what the Buddha calls the pleasure that comes from seclusion, simply that you're not going after unskillful thoughts. That right there brings a certain amount of ease to the mind. There's a passage in the canon where the Buddha talks about devas who are quite corrupted in mind. They spend all their time gazing lustfully at one another, and it wears them out physically and mentally. And so they fall. And a lot of unskillful thinking does just that. It wears you out. So the simple fact that you're not thinking about anything else, not paying attention to anything else, that right there is a level of pleasure that you should learn how to appreciate. And try to maintain that. Allow it to deepen. Allow it to seep into the different parts of your body. And this is where a rapture begins. As a sense of fullness becomes more and more apparent in the different parts of the body that are not being run over by the breath energy. They're allowed to maintain their fullness as you breathe in and as you breathe out. In terms of establishing mindfulness, this is what the Buddha calls developing the establishing of mindfulness. There are actually three stages as you establish mindfulness. One is just that, getting it established, giving yourself a frame of reference. Then, as the Buddha says, you develop it by learning how to understand the principle of cause and effect, how things are originated and how they pass away. Notice he says origination here. It doesn't say just arising. It's origination. You're trying to see cause and effect. And the only way we can see cause and effect is to experiment. Try different ways of breathing. See how you can give rise to sense of ease, a sense of pleasure, how you can get rid of a sense of strain, discomfort. And as you do that, your concentration gets more and more established. Your mindfulness gets more and more established. These two qualities go together. Sometimes you hear about mindfulness and concentration being two totally antithetical qualities. Mindfulness is a broad, open acceptance of things, whereas concentration is a narrow focus, exclusive of all else. That's not how the Buddha talked about it. The two qualities go together. Mindfulness gets fully purified only in the fourth jhana. And the, fact, and the establishments of mindfulness are the themes of concentration. So they're meant to go together. They're meant to be settled and broad, because all the analogies the Buddha uses for concentration, water being kneaded through a ball of dough, a cool font of water coming up into a lake, filling the lake with cool water, lotuses growing in water that are saturated with the water from their roots to their tips, a person sitting with a white cloth covering his entire body. All of these analogies indicate a large, expansive state of mind that fills the body, but is settled and is secure. In fact, that kind of concentration tends to be more firm than the concentration that's focused on a single point, because if you're on a single point, as soon as you move from that point, the concentration is gone. But if the topic of your con concentration, the theme of your concentration, is this full body awareness, then things can come and go within that range of awareness, and they don't knock you off, off your foundation. So right now we're in the developing stage. In terms of mindfulness, is learning the principle of cause and effect. How one thing gives rise to something else, and how when the cause passes away, the effect passes away as well. 
in terms of concentration. It's learning mastery over the concentration, deepening it as you go through more and more refined stages of concentration. When the pleasure is not just the pleasure of not thinking about unskillful things or being away from them, but it's actually being more and more confident, more and more assured about what you're doing. The mind gains greater focus, steadier focus, and so on through the different levels of concentration. And in dealing with skillful qualities, it's not just a matter of giving rise to them and then maintaining and developing them. There comes a point where you let them go as well. In terms of the practice of mindfulness, it's to the point where you can simply are just taking note of the fact you've got the body here, you've got feelings here, whatever your frame of reference is at that point. And that's it. You're not doing anything else at that point because you've developed and everything to its highest point, to its culmination. In terms of concentration, the Buddha describes it as fully mastering concentration the same way that an archer would master archery. You can fire rapid shots in quick succession. You can pierce great, great masses, shoot great distances. In the same way you learn how to develop your concentration and learn how to settle into it gain the pleasure, then gain the sense of nourishment that it can provide. And you learn how to develop it in all situations. So it's not just a matter of sitting here with your eyes closed. You can have a sense of being centered as you walk, as you talk with other people, as you deal with other chores throughout the day. And then you learn how to develop this passion for it by seeing that it, too, is made out of the aggregates. These are in constant stressful, not self. There are subtle vacillations in the pleasure, subtle vacillations in the sense of clarity that you feel in the concentration, and you realize those variations show the element of inconstancy, stress. And then you ask yourself, is this what you really want in life? A constant sense of ease, a sense of well-being that's, well -being that's still su subject to conditions, no matter how nourishing it may be. It's still not the ultimate. At that point, you turn the mind to how good it would be to find a happiness that's deathless. Then you stay right there, just aware of what's there. You're no longer developing anything. And your only task at that point is just whatever comes up, just let it go, let it go. Even the concentration lets go, gets let go of. The mindful activities of mindfulness let get let go of. There's a Deva one time asked the Buddha, how did you get across the river? And he said, by neither pushing forward nor by staying in place. Paradox. But that's what that final level of how you deal with skillful qualities is. Yes, I mean you. You will find it out as you get there. But until you get there, the Buddha allows you to leave it as a paradox. Because for the most part, we're in much too great a hurry to get there, without having done the work. The work is in the maintaining and the developing. And whatever comes up to get in the way, you let that go. But the skillful qualities are things you want to deepen. You want to work at. So it comes to the point where you don't have to work at them anymore. You have completed the duty with that particular quality. You've developed it as far as it can go. It's only then that the, the really cool stuff comes, which is not to say there's not some fairly cool stuff along the way. Having a sense of refreshment that you can tap into whenever you need it, that's not to be sneezed at. But it is something you have to work at to develop. It's not just a matter of watching things come and watching things go and say, okay, there goes concentration. I'm not attached to it. We haven't really given it any opportunity to show its potential. The Buddha wants you to get attached to it. How else are you going to get free? Because you're not attached to concentration. It's like you have little suckers out holding on to all kinds of other things. It's the concentration that allows you to develop a foundation from which you can look at all your other attachments and cut them loose, cut them loose. The pleasures that you used to get out of 
sensuality. You begin to see the drawbacks. And it's not threatening because you've got a better place to keep the mind. As John Lee once said, you can't make the mind zero until you've made it one. You've got to make it one in the concentration, firmly established in mindfulness, very clear about what's going on, not shaken by anything that arises or passes away. So when things do arise and pass away, you can see right through them. You've developed that layer of plaster on the wall so that nothing can get a toehold anymore. And the point of this is to get you really attached to one thing. And then when you let go of that attachment, then there's no other place the mind's going to latch on to. So the Buddha's intentionally trying to get you cornered here in concentration. So when you finally do let go of that, the mind's not going to fall back to its old ways. It's going to go forward into freedom. So the grunt work of meditation, just letting go of distractions and bringing the mind back and trying to stick with it. This is the important work in what we're doing here. And it's good to know that ultimately there will come a point where you don't have to keep on working, but you're not going to get there without working. When they talk about the path and the goal being the same, the most fruitful way of looking at that is Realizing you're not sitting here on a car going down the path and looking ahead to see when is the goal going to show up. It's by looking carefully at where you are right now, each step along the way. That's when the path will lead you to the goal. So you pay all your attention right here to what you have to be doing right here. And that's what will take care of everything else.